Coming up next on The Jeff Curley Show, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, crisis communications. We'll be talking to an expert next. Many are predicting that the worst is yet to come, which is unfortunate, said one person here. Until now, they've enjoyed the reputation of being the nation's icebox. Watched a burglar in his home this morning by webcam. As a journalist of over 25 years, stories are what make my world turn. Reporting live from the Dallas Newsroom tonight, Jeff Crilly, Fox 4 News. But in 2008, I took the jump from my familiar life and started a PR firm from my home. We're talking about anyone with a camcorder like the one I'm using becomes a television network. We started slowly growing the company and we now have over a hundred clients and we've branched into the world of live digital broadcasting. I now own eight different TV studios and have a huge team. And the stories that I now get to share are sometimes the most important of my life. Life has a funny way of coming around full circle. This is the Jeff Crilly Show. Well, all you have to do is watch the news and you see some company or individual in trouble. Some company or individual whose brand is suffering because of something that happened to them or they're mishandling. To talk about crisis communications today, Connie Glover, she is the CEO and founder of C. Marie Marketing Studios. Thanks for yes, coming on the show. sure. Yeah. Excited to be here. Thank you. Well, I want to hear your journey because this is one of my favorite subjects because so many companies mess this up. Uh, tell us about your journey and, and, and who was your mentor? Um, my journey begins back in 2007 when I was working at the time for the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. And I was in the business publishing department. The professors were all writing case studies that got published and used in MBA programs around the country and around the world, actually. Um, at the time, I was just starting my agency, C. Marie Marketing Studio, and one of the professors, Dr. Erica Hayes James, actually approached me and said, do you do what you do, meaning marketing and branding, for individual people? Well, at the time, I kind of said, yes, <laughs> question mark, because I knew I could apply what I did. And so she was my first personal branding client, and she wanted to build her brand outside of academia, consulting as a book author, speaking engagements, that type of thing. We have been building her brand now for years. Um, I worked with her for many years, and she has built her career to where she is now, the dean of the Wharton School um, at the University of Pennsylvania. So. Um, anyway, we worked together, and she was very a great subject, um, and we started building her brand, a website. Back then, individuals having a website wasn't very well known or common or popular. Other professors followed suit. What I learned was, in order to represent them and their brand, sometimes be their voice, literally, when I was posting for their, on their social media, helping them write their blogs, writing statements for the press, et cetera. Um, I had to become expert in their areas of expertise. Their areas of expertise could range from diversity to sustainability uh, to the stakeholder theory of management, et cetera. Erica's thought leadership work was in the field of crisis leadership. Mm. What I learned from her, I was able to take and formulate a crisis communication strategy and plan to help companies be prepared and then be able to execute in the event of a crisis. Um, her work surrounded this notion of crisis management and crisis leadership before, during, and after a crisis. Mm. And what I learned along the way in working with companies is that where a lot of companies fall short is in the before, and that's the most important piece and part and process in the crisis communications and crisis leadership Absolutely, it's, process. It's, it's so important. Some people don't have a plan at all. So we'll yeah. often get calls from people saying, channel eight is in my lobby, can you help? And when I find out- <laughs> what, what do I say? <laughs> when, I find out, <laughs> when I find out what they did wrong, I say, you should have called me yesterday. <laughs> We're going to go on your website. You, you do have a very cool website, and there's a Thank little slideshow that I, I want to uh, roll. Um, I know that uh, crisis communications has gotten more challenging for companies because yes. everything has sped up. When, when I yes. got into the news business in the early 80s, you at least had a couple hours before the 5 o'clock news to come up with a, 
uh, an answer. These days with social media, uh, you can have like a bunch of citizen journalists bashing you. Yes. Case, case in point, Southwest Airlines, which oh. has, you know, I feel bad for those guys because when I came to the market, it was the little airline that could and Herb oh, Kelleher and so beloved. And, and, and London, we still love them. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, and we feel, but we feel bad for them because, man, you talk about a disaster. Yes, when the flights were canceled, yes. Yeah. That was um, very unfortunate. And because they have such a good brand and because they are such a well-loved brand, um, probably gave them a little bit of slack. Mm -hmm. um, and there were actually plenty of news journalists on a national level that were sticking up for them. Yes. Like for example, you have to understand when you are a lower cost airline, there are some things that are not going to be as sophisticated. You're paying for a lower price, right? Yes. When you fly. Um, in this case, where they fell short was in their technology and being able to react immediately and effectively and a little bit more efficiently. Sure. Um, so, but still, I mean, it wasn't, there have been plenty of stories. I can name one going back to a decade or so ago with the BP oil spill sure. and that explosion. That was a worldwide event. It impacted the local communities in Louisiana and Mississippi, but it was a world event. And it was a devastating for years to not only the economy, but to the, the ecosystems. Sure. I mean, just from an environmental, from a personal, from a human standpoint, it, 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 was, it was devastating. Sure. We all remember it. We also probably still remember 12 years later, the response of Tony Hayward, the CEO at the time, when somebody put a microphone in front of him and asked him for a statement. It was one of his first times being interviewed and his comment about, I just want to get my life back, mm. right? It not only wrecked his reputation, the reputation of the company. I don't know that they will ever recover from that despite all of the nice prepared statements that happened after the fact. Yes. If, if I'm still talking about it, and I know people still remember this. Well, let's talk about the importance of transparency, because yes. you mentioned BP Oil. My memory was they they downplayed it. They When the leak was first exposed, they mm -hmm. said, eh, we think it's about 5,000 uh, barrels a day. And it turned out to be something like 20 times that. Sure. And so um, being transparent is so critical, isn't it? It is. And here's why. Well, one, <laughs> why is obvious. Um, the truth is going to come out. To your point about everything happening faster right now, it's going to come out f way faster than it used to. Your most important thing that you can do as a leader of a company and how you communicate your response to a crisis is to be honest with your stakeholders. The people that depend on you as customers, the people in your communities, anybody that's impacted by whatever has just happened, your employees, Sure. Um, stockholders, et cetera. The, the truth is going to happen. You want to be the one to tell that truth. Yes. And you want to be prepared with exactly what you're going to say. And, and the honesty is going to go so much further than anything that I could spin as writing a statement for you. Sure. And I think one thing that companies mess up is sometimes it wasn't something that they did wrong. It happened to them. Mm -hmm. But because they end up either um, lying to the media or um, giving half-truths, now, now they become complicit. Okay, you didn't cause that thing to happen, but your response was horrible. Exactly. You're exactly right. So one of the things that um, I like to focus on when working with companies and coming up with their crisis communication strategy um, is a very comprehensive set of communications that A, are ready to execute at the time, and B, that everybody has rehearsed on an ongoing basis every couple months. Sure. So everybody in the company has to be bought in, in particular the CEO, mm -hmm. because people don't want to hear from the spokesperson. Right when something happens, they want to hear from the guy at the top. Yes. They don't want to hear from somebody that wrote something pretty to say to the press. Okay. So all of those communications involve 
what could potentially happen? Here's our social media response for each of the social media platforms. Here are a series of statements that the CEO will make. Here is what we're going to release out to the press as a press release. Here is the email that we're going to send to this stakeholder group, this stakeholder group, and this stakeholder group. And then you practice. Every single time you can, every couple months, at least once a quarter, you get all of the people involved that are going to be ready to execute when the time comes, and you practice it. Mm -hmm. That's hard to get time on a CEO's calendar to do that. A, it's very easy for them to say, I have more immediate pressing issues, I'll be good. Right. They think and they should know their company better than anybody. But I'm telling you what, in the heat of a crisis and something happens and you've got every single anybody with a phone and including the media ready for you to say something and respond and it has to be within a seconds now with social media. Right you're not going to be wanting to then come up with it. And then you don't want to be Tony Hayward with BP saying, I want my life back or something equally as insensitive right. and unprepared. <laughs> I agree, Connie. Have a spokesperson and a backup spokesperson in case the spokesperson is, is out of pocket. Exactly. Right? Otherwise, exactly. the media, because I was that media for 25 years, we will freelance and we'll just grab an employee walking out of the company sure. and ask them what they think. Yeah. And you never want to surrender your crisis communications plan to you know, the janitor at the company who happens to be leaving for the day. Well, that sometimes, and again, these days, you never know, even if you're saying something you may not know, somebody's recording you. There's so many other things to think about now more than ever, which makes it so critical to be prepared. But part of the crisis communication strategy and plan is to make sure that everybody in the company knows and has a copy of it and knows what their expectation is. So Mr. or Ms. CEO, this is how much, what we're gonna practice for you. This is your role. This is the most critical one. This is your role, this person, this spokesperson, the marketing leader, all of that. And then as employees, if something were to happen, here is your role. Yes. Everybody will play a role. And it's so important, as you said, to have a plan that you don't get the umbrella as it's raining. <laughs> as it's raining and going, I can't figure out how to push it up and cover myself. <laughs> all right, we're, all, we're almost out of time. So for the CEO who's watching this right now saying, I just realized, Connie, that I do not have a plan. What, what, what is it like to engage you? What, what it, do they call you and you see if, if it's a good fit? How, how does it work? Sure. You can either contact me through my website, cmariemarketing.com or on LinkedIn, Connie Glover. Um, I'm happy to take a call, email, connect with me through social media. I just wanna stress one final thing as we're talking. You don't have to be the leader of a big Fortune 500 company. I know I gave the example of BP, but even small software companies, of which there are many these days, anytime you have something that could happen that could impact your customers, could impact the way you do business and more importantly the way your customers do business that can count as a crisis you need to be prepared it could happen to anybody and i'm happy to work with small medium or large companies in formulating a strategy that's the right fit for them outstanding kind of you've been a great guest we'll have to have you Thank back you. soon okay. <laughs> we're, we're going to end with her website which is cmariemarketing.com uh, the great Connie Glover. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. That's it for now. We'll see you next time.